this event for people who couldn't make it. And today we will be touring virtually two different farm operations. Um, this came from, this is being hosted by Aquaculture and Shared Waters, which is a virtual training, not virtual typically, but a aquaculture training program um, that has been running for several years. And due to COVID, it has gone virtual this year. And typically we do a field trip at the end of each course. That was not really feasible this year. So we thought the next best thing would be a virtual farm tour. Um, as I mentioned today, we'll be visiting virtually two operations. First up, we'll be going to Love Point Oysters, which is in Upper Goose Island of Harpswell, uh, where we'll hear from Ben and Cam about their oyster farm. Then we'll head over to Islesboro, where Thomas and Ken are helping to install anchors for a new farm. So that's kind of a fun you know, activity that you don't typically get to see up close and personal. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Afton from the Maine Aquaculture Association, who's helping me out today. She is over at Love Point with Ben and Cam, and they're gonna tell you all about their oyster farm. So go right ahead, guys. Hi, everyone. I'm Cameron, this is Ben. My partner, we're at Upper Upper Goose Island in Harpswell, where we have our about two and a half acre site. Um, we are here. Uh, this is our primary site. It's about a six mile ride from our boat launch that we use. Right. Um, we thought that we would talk about some husbandry challenges and other challenges that we have run into in growing our farm. Um, we're a pretty young farm. We've been, Ben's been operating Love Point since about 2017. I came on in 2019. Uh, in our last couple of years growing the farm. So. Also, I think we just really want to make this a conversation. So if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat or just, uh, you know, we're, we're happy just to respond to um, folks that are interested in learning more about. Um, but we just like to some of so, Yeah. Um, yes. Site location, maybe? So yeah. That, so the site location. Um, we think that a lot of times, so site selection for oyster farms is definitely one of the most important pieces of, of choosing your farm and growing your farm. Uh, and a lot of people, and me included, when I jumped into the went straight to words like water chemistry and like the availability of food for the oysters. And that's really important, but there are a lot of things that people might think of as secondary requirements to site selection that we think are, are super primary. And one of them is kind of matching your site to the gear that you're using and maybe the, the depth of the water in the area and how much protection you get and how, um, how easy it is to work in that site. Um, so we grow in floating cages and we sink those cages for protection from storm and ice in, in the wintertime. Um, and to do that, we need at least around like <laughs> Um, our site is between like four and eight deep at low tide. Um, so that gives the cages ample protection when we sink them down in the winter time. So if you're using that type of gear, you really need a certain amount of depth. Um, we also farm some small sites with floating bags specifically. Um, we don't actually sink in those areas, so they can be shallower. Um, but the biggest thing we found with them is they aren't as rugged as the as the floating cages. So we need a lot more protection for them um, than than we do out here, where we have the floating cages. Um, and then, it, in terms of protection, you just need you need to be able to consider the amount of days that you're going to be able to work, and if you're going to need to do work in the winter time, how long. Um, so just some more specific or, or more general pieces of site selection that don't totally apply to the, like what's the salinity, what's the temperature, how much food is in here. There are other factors that go up to that fish. So we've got one question, which is kind of a little more big picture. 
Why did you guys choose to go into aquaculture in the first place? That's great. Um, we have really different answers to that, I think. Um, I studied environmental science and biology in school and kind of uh, moved into the marine science world pretty quickly just because that's where my interests lie. Um, I initially thought I was headed towards management of commercial fisheries. Um, and I, I spent a couple of months as a fisheries observer, which is essentially someone that goes out on commercial fishing vessels uh, to take data later gets incorporated to, to catch quotas for those fish. Um, and Afton, your audio just cut out for that last bit. Can you hear us? Yes, there we go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Really, I just wanted to find an industry that I could be on the water and, and grow a business and kind of find this intersection of entrepreneurship and the marine science that I'd studied. So I started working on oyster farms. Um, eventually, I went to get my master's at the University of Miami uh, in aquaculture. And then I came back home to Maine to, to work on Love Point with them. So. Uh, my journey here, I think we're here for the same reason, but it was, yeah. it was pretty certain circuitous. Uh, I started on Wall Street as an investment banker, uh, was an English teacher and a coach, um, and then relocated to Maine because my wife was in Maine. We were able to have flexibility. Uh, I wanted to try to make a living on the water if I could, and when I learned about the story of a farm-raised oyster, uh, um, I really just fell in love. It's a very virtuous uh, experience out here, knowing that uh, what we're doing uh, can provide an uh, ecological service um, and ultimately a product that brings a lot of happiness to people. Um, so it's just the kind of work uh, I like to be really active and physical. I don't mind really cold, gnarly snowstorms in the winter. Um, so it's about connecting to nature and doing something you know that I really believe in. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Same here. Could, hopefully, people could see the cages in the background. Um, yeah, we can see them. One of the little hacks we learned from Tom Hedegar, who you're going to be talking to after us, um, when you set a cage on a long line, um, it needs two bridles that connect to the long line. And if you set those bridles wider than the cage is, it helps the cage stay in place. Um, so, originally, we set the cages with bridles that were the same width as the cage and that allowed the cages to move around a lot um so fouled and tangled with their lines yeah they it, wouldn't come loose but they it looked a mess and, and they'd tangle up with each other and so it was something really simple that we as soon as we implemented it it made everything fall into place pretty perfectly and it also allows us uh to flip the cages more easily which is what they're designed to do to, to defoul so um yeah, just a, an important piece when you're setting up your your line if you're using floating cages. So Cameron joined me uh, a year after I started. And when I started, I knew absolutely nothing about this. Um, and I was very skeptical of the technology itself. So for the first year, I never flipped the cage. You literally buy the cage to flip it out of the water to kill off all the fouling. And I didn't do that. And I ended up killing a lot of oysters that way. Um, and so it was a leap of faith, but, you know, use the technology. That's what it's there for. Um, at our farm, we, you know, it'll vary depending on your site and water temps, but generally during the growth season here, we flip the cage over for 24 hours, right? All the way overnight. And uh, we do that once a week. So um, I, it's just another simple thing that makes a huge difference in terms of uh, how well the creatures in your care will ultimately do. Yeah. So along those lines, are there any other questions? Yeah, we've got a question um, about, you know, what are were some of the biggest challenges you faced when you first started your farm? You were kind of touching on that with biofouling, um, but when you first got going, what were would you face? Well, we had a barnacle set that was pretty gnarly, um, and it turned out not flipping the cages <laughs> was the reason the barnacles were able to set on the cages. Um, and we address that really easily just by flipping them. Um, but the thing there is that the, the larger barnacles can survive the flip the same way the oysters can, but having the, the routine 
like schedule flip through the season uh, doesn't allow them to set and get strong enough to survive that. But so we had that schedule set in place and all the older oysters that had, were held over from before our schedule, like our, our set routine ended up having really bad barnacle problems, even though we were flipping and we had to like scrape off barnacles from like 45,000 market oysters. And it was like the worst month of our lives. Um, but so far, and I think there's also a lot of seasonality to barnacle sets and muscle sets, and that's going to change year to year. Um, but knock on wood, we feel like our uh, defouling schedule really helps us with a lot of that. Um, obviously, you're not flipping the gear over the winter time, so there are sets of other fouling organisms that will uh, get in there while your stuff is on the bottom or are in the water while the tents are freezing um, above the water. But if you can kind of get yourself into action for spring cleaning when you bring stuff up and trade out a lot of that foul gear and clean stuff up before the oysters are really pumping and, and thin them out if you can, uh, then it helps a lot because baby mussels, uh, barnacles, all sorts of stuff. If the oyster, if there's more water movement and you're starting to flip, then things will flow away and you have a lot less foul. So. Uh, that's definitely one of our biggest legendary challenges. The other biggest challenge uh, to growing a small farm has been the acquisition of space, for sure. Um, so we're lucky enough, Ben got this experimental lease uh, a few years ago now. Um, other than that, we have been in the leasing process for another small lease uh, in Freeport Waters for about two years now. Um, and we've had to kind of bridge that gap with LPAs, a couple of few LPAs that we've got. Um, and so really, it's just this balancing for us that is this ongoing struggle um, of balance. Uh, timeline it takes to grow an oyster and the timeline it takes to get more space and, and kind of how you plan for your business's growth and, and balance those two things when they're both uncertain. Um, and that's that's probably, I think, our, our biggest challenge in business for sure. So we did have a more um, specific question and you kind of touched on it. How much space do you need for farming oysters? And I think earlier you talked about siting, but how do you choose where to farm? Space is entirely dependent on how many oysters we want you to grow. Yeah, exactly. Um, and if you're doing a, a hobby scale farm or if you really want to make uh, a living out of it that's full time. Um, yeah, I think for us, we're still, uh, we're absolutely building to a place where we're able to pay ourselves a real salary. We're not there yet. Um, and we have about two and a half acres here and we're applying for another four um, and then we have uh, seven LPAs between the two of us and that would, I think that's going to be tight space to pull off our, our two calories with a, couple, with a little bit of seasonal help. Um, but it really depends on how you want to farm, what gear type you use. Um, I think obviously you don't want to take more than you need, but um, more space is more helpful. Oysters really benefit from lower densities when you can. Um, so if, if you don't have to fill your bags halfway or, or three quarters or completely, um, that's better for the organisms. They want the lower densities, they want the more water flow. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's obviously super dependent on how much you want to grow, what size your business is, um, but yeah. Great. And then on that note, how do you organize your cages? Um, are you keeping similar sized oysters close together? Um, and how do you manage for that as the farm grows? That's, uh, that's been a, one of our struggles. We invested in a tracker. Um, that's helped a lot. Uh, before that, we created an Excel spreadsheet where um, like every cell bag on the farm and that was pretty tedious as we started to, to grow out this lease. Um, but uh, we do try to keep, um, you know, year classes together as best we can. If we had a little yeah. more space, it'd that be easier. easier. Uh, we're pretty space constrained. So sometimes the only available space is uh, 
for, for market oysters might be like in the middle of some seed. Um, but the tracker helps. I mean, it's just essential, I think, when you get to some scale to have a system to record exactly uh, what goes where. And um, oyster tracker has been really helpful. Um, we we try to keep have some logic to where we keep our seed versus where we keep our market oysters too so like the northeast corner so the northeast line is where we tend to keep all our market oysters that tends to get the most action from our prevailing winds in terms of uh, wave action and water movement and so they get roughed up a bit more um and it's just more water moving through it's deeper so it's probably a couple of degrees cooler um versus the line one which is the closest to the island and to us is the most protected um and so we kind of when we're dealing with smaller oysters we try to keep it moving like small it's the largest as you get less protected um, and yeah so that Obviously, that changes when we run out of space and we're moving stuff around. Um, but every now and then, if things get really disorganized, we have just a, what we call playing musical bags and pull a bunch of stuff out into the boat or now onto the barge um, and then put it back and organize it a little bit. And it's, it's really helpful to be as organized as possible when you're space constrained um, because otherwise you're, you lose track of things really quickly. Um, yeah. Another thing that we've found is helpful in flipping once a week is it forces you to look at the oysters every week in every single cage. And so it's a great way to like come across something and be like, oh, shoot, what, what's this? Why is it here? Why is it foul? Why is it different than everything around it? Like we must have missed something. Um, and so you catch things like that when you actually look at your oysters every week as you flip the cage up and, and look inside the back. So, um, yeah, just whether it's flipping or not, it's really helpful to, to just be out there and be present and looking at all your stuff and keeping a well-organized farm. Along, along those lines, uh, Dana Morris gave us a great piece of advice. Um, he said, how often do you open your oysters to see what they look like inside and to check their health? Is there food in the belly? Um, and we hadn't been doing a lot of that. And now it's a really regular practice um, when we harvest, when we're sorting, um, yeah. we'll, we'll Do they look happy and burp? healthy. What does the, the mantle look like? What is the, if it's the growing season, what is like the leading edge of the shell look like? Um, some things you can do from outside, but really you should open them and see how they look inside. Cause that's what people will see at the end. We want to show them the barge. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> tell tell us about, um, this baby started as two metal pontoons uh, in my yard, and we fashioned some beams across. We learned the hard way that the beams need to be every two feet, not every five feet, or the boards will buckle. Um, we built a beautiful storage cabinet on the back rigged with solar um, that will run our sorter eventually when it gets on the barge. But uh, relative to our oyster skip here, which we've operated out of for three years now, it uh, more than doubles our, our surface area to work. And I think our uh, building skills slowly evolved. We're most proud of this table. It's actually square and uh, it's pretty rugged. So uh, this is the barge. Improvement. Yeah, we have storage and a sorting table and space for our tube sorter. That's another thing that we uh, pushed further than we probably should have. We've been, I think sorting your oysters is unbelievably important and keeping like sizes with like is a task that I believe is impossible by hand. Um, and I, I think that the investment in a tube sorter uh, and building one yourself if you have the time um, is really important. Um, it helped us in, in so many ways trying to just keep oysters with uh, similar sized oysters and making sure that everything, especially if you're running dead season higher than you'd like to, everything is happy and healthy and moving into the winter. I think there are a million different hacks to try and have oysters survive uh, the winter. And really, in our experience so far, the biggest one is having them be healthy when they go down for the winter. And, and 
making sure that they're not, uh, the little oysters aren't trying to compete with all the big oysters for the food in like the end of the season, right before they start to hibernate uh, is really important. Otherwise you're gonna end up with a lot of oysters that don't have the reserves they need for winter time and, and aren't gonna survive. Uh, and that's helped us a lot is just being really religious about uh, sorting. And I would say sorting early. Um, it's easier to see the difference in sizes when the oysters are larger, but um, it's a very hard thing to describe without a graph. Um, if you think about oyster as a function of its length versus its like cubic volume, when, um, when an oyster is really small, the curve for, you know, as the oyster gets longer, the curve for volume is like straight up. Right, these things are, are expanding so rapidly in terms of the volume they take up. Um, and that's the time when it's like harder to see the difference in their sizes, but it's really important to sort them at that time when they're small, because that's when the volume is, is changing so quickly. We um, have countless anecdotes of us like opening bags and being like, oh, these guys all look the same uh, roughly. Like, enough. we really need to sort them. Should we have brought the sorter out today? Yeah. And then we run them through and we get like a 50-50 separation on size. And that's a really important separation. So you end up with half the oysters being in one side size class from the sorter and the other half being in the other size. And that's something that we wouldn't have been able to tell just by opening and being like, oh, you know, they look pretty similar, but and hand sort harder to do that. Hand sorting oysters that size is yeah. pretty much impossible. You're, biases you, yeah. just, you just won't be accurate about it so it's something that's really important i think and you can build something that's super simple right like a hand crank tube uh you can use mesh from bags all sorts of different things but having something that isn't like a visual uh decision in, in your brain is important. these are such great pieces of advice you guys um speaking of you know harvest and and grading what are your markets like this year um you know you're in busy season right now and hopefully restaurants are coming back but just kind of curious to hear where things are at for you yeah restaurants are definitely coming back i think the spring maybe it's on a, a reduced scale but uh springtime and late spring leading into the summer especially in Maine is a time when restaurants are really hungry for oysters because they the oysters start through April pretty much um, and so you're working if you're harvesting through the winter time you're, you're working with a finite resource for that time and it's not you don't want it's not good business practice to end up with a huge surplus at the end of that season so people try to run it pretty thin and what happens is most farms and us included uh don't have enough products um when late spring rolls around because we're waiting on the new crop to grow um and so restaurants are really hungry for oysters right now because uh, most farms don't have a ton of product uh, because they weren't through it over the winter time so i would suggest really trying to plan your production as much as you can and, and making sure that you can meet those demands because it's helpful for us to be able to say yes to restaurants when they want to or when they want oysters uh, and it's then it's easier to stay in those restaurants through the summer um right now uh, yeah people are excited to buy oysters we wish we had more than we did um but we're also still very small scale uh if we were at a larger scale i'm sure it would still be uh still be struggling because there's still a lot of comeback to happen in, in the economy and the restaurant industry so well, that's great to hear for you guys. And um, I think with that, we don't have any more questions. So I think, thank you very much. I think we'll head over to Islesboro now, but we really appreciate you guys joining us and taking the time out of your day to show us around the operation. All right, thanks guys. So next up, um, like I said, we are going to head over to uh, Ken Sparta and Thomas Henninger who are up in Islesboro. Um, they are assisting with um, setting up some anchors at a new farm. And so Thomas, I'm going to hand it over to you because I believe your video was working a bit better than Ken's.
fuck. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> <That's not educational. laughs> How do I get me? Uh, oh, here it is. Okay. The old salt. All right, how's that? Oh, I got it. <laughs> there we go. Uh, <laughs> all right, so you guys can see us okay? We sure can, and we can hear okay. you. There's the lighthouse on Islesboro. So and, tell us uh, what you're up to. Okay, so I'm sorry, I thought I heard, so I didn't, when I was talking before, it was just to you? Yep. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so um, we are here in Islesboro because we were hired by a local person uh, to build a farm uh, for him and his family. And um, it's, uh, he's starting out with four LPAs of oyster grows. He's in uh, 12 feet of water. And this is a fellow who's never been to a class, read a couple things I asked him to read. He just thinks it's a really cool idea. And um, he's you know kind of starting out as a hobbyist, but he's starting pretty big. Um, and he owns uh, a home on that point over there. It's a beautiful home. Uh, his name's Bob, Bob Giles. Um, he uh, has found a source of seed locally. And um, we got Kim, say hi, and Blake, Kim's son. Hi. They are Islesboro Oyster. Uh, we, are doing, we did our best to contact everybody in the area and get them involved and to make uh, sometimes Zoom, sometimes email, sometimes phone introductions between local farmers and, and our new guy here. Um, he's in California right now. Um, so we uh, we had, uh, we hired Alicia Guerrero, who's a new farmer in Casco Bay, to do the GIS uh, work. So she uh, did a little bit of research, laid out the farm, we talked about where it might go, and she gave us uh, center points for the LPAs and anchor points for the LPAs. So we came over today. Our original plan was to use uh, uh, screw anchors, um, helix anchors, but we got a little bit of local knowledge that it's pretty bony in there. So rather than take the risk, uh, we just switched over to steel pyramids. So we're using 150 pound pyramids in mostly mud. Um, so today we, we put those anchors in. We're gonna let those anchors uh, work their ways in for a couple of weeks. And then we're going to come back and uh, all the cages are stacked up on the point over there. Um, we're going to come back and uh, we're going to build a farm. Maybe we could have some of them help. What do you think? Yeah, anybody wants to come help, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're more than welcome. Um, so what are the anchors for? Are those um, kind of the boundary lines? What lines are they holding? No, so these are LPAs and um, the um, I I designed a, a rope system with the guys at Oyster Grow that um, you, if you use it, you end up with, I think, 398 feet, square feet on the surface. So it's a rope kit that maximizes an LPA. Um, the anchors for that LPA, because it's an LPA, don't have to be within the LPA, like a lease. So the anchors are actually about 300 feet apart but there's only 400 square feet of cages on the surface. Um, and we built, uh, we put four anchors for four of those in. And we can get the surface equipment close by making an X and overlapping the anchor lines, which is how it's done up in PEI and in, in Brunswick to, to maximize this, the, uh, the use of leases up there. Um, does anybody have any Questions? Feel free to put your questions into the chat, everybody, as we go along here. While, while we're waiting for those, so Thomas is uh, Madeline Point Oyster Farm in, yeah, can we get that in there? <laughs> it's, I see it. So, so in, in Yarmouth, Maine, and I'm Spartan Sea Farms in Freeport, um, I farm oysters, kelp, scallops, mussels, and quahogs. <laughs> and urchins coming soon and thomas is doing uh we've got oysters uh, a couple scallops for a hobby um we do kelp in the winter and we would be fascinated by doing urchins we can't wait to learn about that and i also upwell seed for other farmers in the area 
<laughs> so this virtual farm tour is, is awesome. And it's great that you guys are getting out here virtually, but both Thomas and I wanted to extend an invitation to come out on our boats. Um, it's really the best way for us to teach you things and, and for you to learn things and, you know, and it's just fun. So come on out on the boat. <laughs> yep. And we love day drinking. Keep that in mind. And uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, this LPA system that I'm talking about, it's much easier to explain it when you can have it right in front of you. So if anybody's interested, just, just give me a call. So speaking of boats, we got a request to see your new vessel. Is that what you're oh. on? Oh, okay. Uh, here, I'll do the aerial view. Uh, without falling in the water. All right. <laughs> so this hall was designed by Jesse Lowell, who is a sixth generation lobster boat builder who has decided to learn how to work in welded aluminum. Um, and we think he did a really good job. I mean, it's, it's essentially a big flat bottom boat uh, with gunnels that are very close to the water, which allows you to pick up an oyster grow very easily and set it on the rail. Um, we also have this groovy davit that you see, and we use that for lots of things, but we use it for picking the silos up out of our flupsies. We can extend it. Um, boom, there you go. It can extend over a dock and we can pick up a, uh, a silo full of oysters without having to put our backs into it. Um, and the table, it extends out another eight or 10 feet, um, but it also has a gadget. <laughs> it also has a gadget that hooks up here. That's like a big hopper. And we can use the davit to raise the seed silos dump the seed silos into the hopper and then we have a shaker table that fits right there that we dab it onto the boat on seed days so it makes um flup seeing seed a lot easier no picking up silos anymore um let's see what else uh it has a resplendent dive platform <laughs> because we find that we do a lot of diving and especially diving in the winter it's awfully nice to have a big uh, dive platform. That ladder can hook up there and you end up with a really nice surface um, so you don't fall in the water, which I've never done. Um, <laughs> there's our helm. There's our life jackets and such. Um, let's see. I guess that's it. Hey, Thomas, hey, what's, what's she called? What's her name? Her name is Bumblebee. Bumblebee. No, no, no. With an M. Mumblebee. Mumblebee. <laughs> um, mumble, <laughs> and Mumblebee is actually was the nickname, uh, was the nickname of a design uh, out of Colchester, England around the turn of the century. They had small um, sailing vessels that almost looked like beetle cats, if you remember them, but a little longer, gaff rigged. And they referred to them as mumblebees. And I cannot find anything in the lit literature to suggest why they're called mumblebees, but I just thought it was a cool name. Well, you know, you know, there's a town in Wales called Mumbles. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. Thank you, Thomas, for the boat tour. So uh, you bet. we do have one other question in here back to um, the LPA. Yes. So uh, is that a single line of cages per LPA or are they doubled up on the line? It is a single line of cages. And because the anchors are so far apart, it allows you to, um, uh, the long cantonary of line that makes up the bottom line. It's this very long cantonary. It provides a, a slow acting spring and it makes it very, very easy on your gear and storms and such. And since we switched over to this Canadian, this method that we stole from Canada, basically, um, we haven't lost a single cage. We haven't parted a single line, except when I run into it with my boat once. Um, but besides that, um, we, uh, we haven't lost any gear since we switched to this new method. That's great. And so we did ask, um, when people registered for if they had any questions ahead of time. I asked a few of those of Ben and Cameron, I wanna hand those over to you guys. 
We had a couple people asking, different people asking about siting in general. So how do you decide where to put your farm? Um, How much space do you need? How do you organize your cages? That type of thing. So we looked at LPAs as prospecting. Um, We knew we were going to have a big lease. Uh, So we took advantage of the sort of LPA system by placing disparate LPAs all around the area, Um, the area that, you know, we could get to with our boats, the area that we knew uh, wasn't being used by other uh, people on the water. Um, So we spread out these four LPAs and then we convinced uh, a local teacher at the high school we explained that a great project to do with his students would be to have them measure the relative growth of the oysters in the four LPAs. So we had uh, high school students on the farm every week um, measuring the, uh, they did water quality measurements, but what was really helpful was they measured how fast the oysters were growing in each area. Um, And we had two areas that we really loved. And those are the two areas where we now have uh, experimental leases. I, I did something a little bit different. I, I had a, about 20 years of kayak experience in the body of water where I wanted to be. So I had that hand dragging in the water knowledge. But then I went and dove everybody else's leases around me and saw how all their oysters were doing. Because, you know, that whole shared waters thing, divers can go down and check out your stuff. And then I went to the, a few of the local lobstermen that I knew were really cratchety. And I said, so I'm making room for myself. Where do you want me to make room? And together we kind of came up with some places that they were okay with me being. Um, we have a lot of lobstermen that, that fish out of Freeport and it's important to stay tight with those folks. So, so the method that I used, I call the coffee cup method. <laughs> and it's the, it's, it's the method that I, all the people, I think you guys understand that I sell the Oyster Grow brand. I sell the cages and I get, so I get a lot of new farmers and I recommend the coffee cup method, which is um, you figure out the places where you would want to place an LPA or a farm. And then you drink your coffee in the morning in your pickup truck where you can see that LPA. You drink your coffee in the evening where you can see that LPA. and after a while, you'll get an idea of a rhythm of the people that are using the water in the area. You can write down the names of boats, um, but it has to be a regular activity over a tremendous, a long period of time to really do a good job. I spent a year drinking coffee um, and I came up with the names of some of the lobstermen and then I approached those lobstermen and um, I ended up doing pretty well that way. To, to put that in perspective, okay, where my Um, lease application is for my shared lease there are three weeks during the entire year where there's lobstermen nearby only three weeks so if you look at it any of the rest of the year there's no lobstering going on but during those three weeks they're there but they have like specific places where they wanted to be and and by working with them I was able to to make sure that my lease didn't include any of those spots Um, It maybe isn't the water that I would have chosen, but it's great water and it's water that everybody's happy for me to be in. That's a great point. Thank you, guys. We have a question in the chat here. Do you know how many aquaculture farms are in the area Um, and where you are in particular in Islesboro? um, You know, it doesn't seem to be many in Penobscot. Let's ask ask him. (laughs) How many how many farms are right in this area? Um, I think within this whole harbor, there is seven soon to be eight. Yeah, so would you say it's turning into a bit of an aquaculture hub area? Um, Absolutely. So in addition to this, uh, on the north end of the island, there's Marshall Cove Mussel, um, which they are in the process of um, going from their experimental lease to their standard lease. Great product. Um, And I think south of here, some LPAs for scallops, so I think that uh, it really is kind of becoming uh, a local industry. And the the, uh, the oysters are nearly as good as the oysters in Casco Bay. <laughs> well, almost as good, yeah. Um, where we are in Casco Bay, there's 21 different farms, right, right in there. And 
seven of them are members of the Maine Family Sea Farm Cooperative too, which is something that um, if you guys want to talk about at some point, we, we are happy to share information about that. We formed a co-op to share both knowledge and resources and, you know, to hang out. Day drinking. To hang out. I like it. <laughs> Poker games, you know. <laughs> So did, like since we're kind of getting into the zoomed out topics, we did have one question um, before the event come through asking, you know, at the big picture, what are challenges that are facing the industry as a whole? Um, you guys don't have to get too specific if you want, but we were kind of touching on the siting, the gear. Um, but if you zoom out, what are some bigger items? Well, so, yeah, you guys understand that, um, uh, the future of the machinations that it takes to get a lease could possibly change with all the interest we have from, you know, uh, uh, outside forces, let's say. That's a big deal. We have all of the farmers in our co-op had counted on having a specific you know, lease size at this point in the development of their businesses. And that has to happen. And you know, for whatever reason, we, we know for a fact that the folks at DMR are working their butts off, but we think that uh, our state needs to give DMR more resources if they want to see this business really be a player uh, in the state and in the nation. Um, the other thing I'm thinking is, uh, of course, climate change, you know, and, and knowing we can't know what's around the corner biologically. And with regards to that, our sources of seed are kind of limited you know we have two or three options um that's a little spooky if something goes south in one or two of them um what else can um i think you know the probably the most important thing to know is that as an industry we're incredibly collaborative and we work together really well this is our biggest strength we need to have that strength so you guys when you enter this industry you have to continue that tradition um, I think as long as we stick together and work together, we're going to be just fine, but we need to do that. Yes. That's awesome. Thank you guys. We super, we really appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day to join us from the water. We don't have any further questions. So I think with that, we will end this really fun farm tour. We really appreciate everyone who tuned in. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. All righty. Have a good one, everybody. Uh, take care. Bye. Bye, guys. Thanks, Thank you. I love point. Sure. <laughs> Bye, Ben. Bye-bye.